Hello and good afternoon. My name is Zach Mentz, Senior Editor for Cannabis Business Times, and welcome to today's webinar, Getting to Know the 2022 California Energy Code Requirements for Indoor Grows and Greenhouses. Today's webinar is hosted by Cannabis Business Times in partnership with Dr. Greenhouse. And today's webinar is also hosted by Dr. Greenhouse founder and president, Dr. Nadia Saba. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Saba for today's webinar. Welcome. Hi, Zach. Thank you so much for having me on this webinar. I'm excited to talk about the energy code. Likewise, we're looking forward to hearing what you talk about. And uh, yeah, there's a lot to cover here. So tell you what, we'll let you take the floor and run. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everyone. I am going to try to make something um, maybe a little bit dry, hopefully interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest, um, no matter how dry an energy code might be, a lot of in interest in the industry in what the heck is going on, um, what the various energy code measures are going to be. Um, they will be enforced in uh, January 1st of 2023 here in California. Um, and I'm, I, I do wanna just preface that I'm focused Focusing on California. I know that there are other energy codes and standards that are being established in other states and local jurisdictions. We're going to focus here today on California, um, but there are other resources that I'll talk about later if you want to learn about what might be happening in your state if you're not in California. All right. So we're going to talk today about getting to know the 2022 California Title 24 energy code requirements for indoor grows and greenhouses also known as, by the code, Controlled Environment Horticulture. So just a basic overview. Uh, why Controlled Environment Horticulture? Why is it being regulated? Uh, where, what, where does the interest lie? Where is it coming from? What's included in the energy code? What's not included in the energy code? And what is the future of uh, CEH-related energy codes? And how can you get involved? OK, so. What is controlled environment horticulture? It is a building space that is dedicated to plant production. We all know it as indoor grows and greenhouses. Now, one of the first questions I have as someone who's been in the controlled environment agriculture industry for almost 25 years now is why did they call it CEH as opposed to CEA, the industry accepted terminology? Well, it simply comes down to the fact that in California, there's another CEA, the California Energy Alliance, and they were concerned uh, when putting this, uh, this code language together that people would get confused because the other CEA also has to do with energy. It's actually a nonprofit stakeholder group of businesses, government, and NGOs working to improve energy standards and policies. Um, there are some familiar names um, to the cannabis industry. Signify, which now owns uh, Fluence. Uh, we have BioSlighting, the Design Light Consortium, and other manufacturers and vendors and individuals uh, who are part of the stakeholder group. Um, I would encourage all of you listening uh, to check them out and see if it's something that you want to get involved with because you can help shape right the future of um of the energy code in in this particular industry and market so why ceh right well energy you know there there have been some studies that have come out um and some data that's been recorded by various states and cities who were some of the early adopters of allowing recreational cannabis um production in in their regions or in their states uh, you know, in Massachusetts, uh, there was a study that came out that showed that cannabis facilities, indoor cannabis facilities using HID grow lights used more energy, two times more energy per square foot than the next highest, the current industry standard um, for the highest energy use intensity, which is quick service restaurants. Um, and so you see this green bar chart here on the left and oh my God, right? Like cannabis facilities using HID lighting use a lot of energy, that's scary. Then in Denver, they noticed this trend over time, right? After they um, uh, passed legalization of recreational cannabis, 
um, in 2012, they saw the trend, that red line increase for all of the energy use in the city of Denver. Um, and as you can see, cultivation growers, that blue portion of the chart represented the greatest amount or greatest portion of that increase. So California and other states see this, right? And they're like, oh my goodness, what can we do to maybe curb or limit the energy use um, of this industry so it doesn't blow out our carbon action plans, our decarbonization goals, right? All of these goals that we have around climate and energy. You know, when we break it down, we notice that lighting and HVAC are the two biggest contributors to how much energy and especially electricity is used for controlled environment horticulture facilities. Um, the graph on the left, this is non-cannabis, um, but it's pretty similar to cannabis. You can see that lighting and then cooling and heating and other mechanical systems make up pretty much all of the energy use um, to grow this crop indoors. You know, if you put heating and mechanical on top of cooling vents, it would basically be the same energy use as lighting, which we see in multiple facilities. A lot of people think it's all lighting, but we need that HVAC system, right? To remove the heat from the lights and that the, the water vapor from the plants that are transpiring. So I just wanna do a little overview of the California Energy Code because my guess is that most of the people who are listening to this are not super familiar with the California Energy Code or any of the building codes for that matter, unless you're a building, a builder or a designer or contractor. But if you're a grower or an investor, chances are you don't have to delve too much into the building codes. So the California Energy Code and, and the International Energy Codes um, kind of break it down by building types and processes. So Building types are residential, right? Your homes, high-rise residential, um, which tend to be mixed use. So there might be, right, a restaurant or a store downstairs, but then, you know, a tower of, of homes above that. And then non-residential, which includes commercial, industrial, and institutional. Institutional being like your schools, right? Um, and then there's covered processes. Now, covered processes are activities in a building for purposes other than human occupancy. So think of data centers, commercial kitchens, refrigerated warehouses, elevators. We still need to condition that process because maybe the motors to run those elevators are producing a lot of heat. Well, we need the HVAC for that, right, to cool it down. But that's not for people necessarily. That's just to keep the motors running, right? So what the Energy Commission has decided to do is to list controlled environment horticulture as a covered process, not a building type. This has some potential advantages. Um, so the energy code is right has these different energy efficiency standards associated with it. And, and there's kind of three basic types of measures. There's mandatory measures. You have to do them no matter what. Um, there's prescriptive measures where there's minimum energy efficiency standards that you can sort of pick and choose and trade off. Um, and then there's performance measures where you would do an energy model. So controlled environment horticulture and the covered process is all mandatory measures. Why is that? Well, the, the biggest reason is because prescriptive and performance measures have specific goals to reduce energy use below a baseline threshold. In controlled environment agriculture and controlled environment horticulture, we don't have enough good data to establish a baseline building or baseline energy use um, or even baseline crops, right? Um, control environment horticulture is really complex. There's different buildings and systems and crops and locations and climate zones. You know, if we just take a look at building types, we have indoor single level, in, indoor multi-level, greenhouses that are traditional, greenhouses that are conditioned, and then the cannabis licensing types kind of muddy that water even more. There's, I mean, it, just in California, and, and I'm sure every state has slightly different license types, but in California alone, there are five different cannabis licenses you can get, right? Specialty cottage, 
um, specialty small, medium, large cultivation. There's nurseries and processors. Um, there's mixed light, uh, greenhouse tier one, which is low uh, lighting level, less than six watts per square foot, and mixed light tier two, which is six to 25 watts per square foot. And this mixed light greenhouse, right, or this mixed light license type, the way it's defined is that it's a greenhouse, it's a hoop house, it's a glass house, it's a hot house, it's a conservatory. Well, I hate to tell you, but greenhouse, glass house, and hot house are pretty much all the same thing. Um, I would have a hard time defining them differently from each other, except glass house, I guess, is covered in glass where a greenhouse may not be. Um, and then a hoop house is usually not conditioned, right? It's usually you roll up the, the sidewalls and, and close them and, and do open ventilation and just kind of let, right, like tunnel airflow blow through. And a conservatory, you know, that's something that you'd find in a botanical garden that's not for really production agriculture at all. Um, so mixed light um, covers all of those different greenhouse types. And what about the baseline crop types, right? We all know, right, that different crops have different needs. If you're a cannabis grower, and I think most of you who are going to be listening to this are, um, you know, you need, a, right, they are light, hungry plants. They like it temperatures high. Um, and and I, I know you guys are thinking, well, high, but relatively high compared to a lot of other crops. A lot of times there's multiple rooms involved, right? The, the cropping cycle is long, three to four months. You know, you have to go through lab testing. But if we compare that to lettuce, lettuce doesn't need a lot of light. It likes kind of cooler temperatures. You grow it in the same room over a four to six week period, and they're thinking about food safety, right? So just looking at crops alone, regardless of the building type, we have very different can I use the word animals, um, when we're thinking about controlled environment horticulture. So what is the state of energy use in controlled environment horticulture? Well, I am proud to announce here um, in this webinar that we just published a 106 page literature review of the energy and water use in controlled environment horticulture, including potential energy efficiency opportunities that that we think have um, have a real chance of having a high impact on reducing resource utilization without negatively, you know, uh, impacting um, commercial production. Um, and the lit review was supported by the Emerging Technologies Coordination Council uh, here in California. Just some takeaways. I, I would encourage all of you to read this if you're interested. I have a, I have a link to it here. Um, you can come to our website or contact us and we can point you to the way to find this lit review. But some of the takeaways that we had was, you know, cannabis facility reported energy usage ranges between 50 and 800 kilowatt hours per square foot of canopy hour. Think about that. That is a tenfold difference in energy use. With non-cannabis, it's not much better. 18 to 500 um, kilowatt hours per square foot. So they're actually kind of within the same range, right? When you think about cannabis and non-cannabis. Um, but that range is huge and depends on so, so many factors. Most of the reported energy use for controlled environment horticulture facilities is based on models not actual energy use data from facilities. In fact, a lot of those models aren't even validated with data collected from operating facilities. Most of the published studies reference Evan Mills 2012 paper that many of you might be familiar with. It is now 10 years old um, and I would like to, to think a little bit obsolete um, or a lot obsolete. Um, and the data that is collected is inconsistent with a lot of different metrics reported. We tried our best to standardize the metrics in our lit review so that we could make equal comparisons, right? To get that 50 to 800 kilowatt hours per square foot. But look at this list at the bottom of this slide. There are literally 12 different metrics associated with energy 
that we found in all of the literature. And, and we referenced over a hundred different papers, magazine articles, research um, manuscripts. I mean, there's watts per square foot, watts per square meter, watts per canopy area, per room area, grams per square foot, grams per light, grams per kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour per area, kilowatt hour per harvest cycle, kilowatt hour per year, kilowatt hour per unit sold. I mean, it's a lot to digest and it's really hard, right, to navigate a solution when everybody is speaking a different language. So to get to a performance-based compliance approach, which I think we would all like because we can demonstrate energy efficiency beyond just mandatory measures, but to do that, we need data. We need industry accepted energy metrics and we need participation from growers like you and transparency from all stakeholders involved. Because, you know, in my opinion, and, and we've designed, a, you know, almost 150 facilities, cannabis and non-cannabis throughout the country and around the world. And I will tell you right now that, you know, this greenhouse and this indoor farm does not equal the earth going up in smoke, right? This, this is not all fire and brimstone. You guys are doing a better job than you're giving credit for, but without transparency and without data, right? It's hard to prove and demonstrate what is actually happening so that people understand why using energy is important in the first place to grow a plant that we are going to eat or consume and use as medicine. So let's get into it. Okay. So the 2022 Title 24, Part 6, Section 120.6H is the section there where you will find controlled environment horticulture covered process mandatory measurement measures. Whew, it's a mouthful. Although it's part of the 2022 energy code, it, it becomes effective January 1st of 2023. So it has not been enforced yet. It will start to be enforced um, in just a few months from now. Um, and uh, one other thing I want to say is that it is not retroactive. So it's only for new builds. It is not for those of you who have an existing facility. But if you do a major retrofit or expansion, you will likely have to comply with these measures. Okay, so let's start with their definition of controlled environment horticulture. One thing you are going to notice in these upcoming slides, and I did this on purpose, is where they crossed something out to keep the accepted language or the language that it has been adopted for the energy code. I wanted you guys to all see the redlined version because I think it's important because a lot of those of you who did participate in stakeholder feedback um, really got a lot of these measures trimmed down. You helped define the industry um, for the studies that went into um, uh, generating these energy codes. So good job. Um, and, and, and this is what we, what we have. Okay, so controlled environment horticulture space is a building space dedicated to plant production by manipulating indoor environmental conditions such as through electrical lighting, mechanical heating, mechanical cooling, or dehumidification. Controlled environment horticulture does not include building spaces where plants are grown solely to decorate that same space. So I guess not house plants. Um, uh, you will see that one of the, term, the terms here that are crossed out, they removed irrigation. That is interesting to know. Um, they also um, have, you know, kind of removed greenhouse and indoor growing as types of controlled environment horticulture spaces, though we know that's what they are and, and they are sort of separately defined for each of the measure measures. So the covered processes for controlled environment horticulture are in four categories. There's HVAC, lighting, the greenhouse envelope, and power metering. Okay, so first, the first measure, number one, is indoor grows and dehumidification. 
So dehumidification should be one of the following. First off, it needs to comply with the federal standards for efficiency based on the testing standards that have been set up. Now, the, the challenge with dehumidification, as a lot of my HVAC friends know, is that those testing standards are based on residential applications, not on controlled environment horticulture applications. There are, uh, we have a lot of friends in the HVAC industry, equipment and manufacturers who are trying to improve these testing standards and get some um, uh, approved uh, specifically for this application. But for now, we are bound by the federal requirements uh, for efficiency um, uh, for residential applications. Okay, also, if you have an integrated HVAC system, so one that does cooling and dehumidification, right, and maybe some reheat um, at the same time or, or all in the same package, uh, then 75% of the reheat needs to be recovered. So hot gas reheat, right? That's the one that everybody is familiar with. If you have a chilled water system, same idea. They want 75% of the heat recovered or 75% of the reheat used for dehumidification to come from heat recovery. So that could be if you had a cogen system or a heat recovery chiller or some other process that's generating waste heat, they want us to recover that to provide 75% of the heating. Um, or you can use solid or liquid, liquid desiccant dehumidification systems for buildings that require a dew point of 50 degrees or less. In other words, very dry and cold. Um, usually that would be a, applicable to a drying or curing room. Okay, moving on to lighting. I know this was the one that got probably the most feedback from the community, both from growers as well as from lighting manufacturers and not just the HID lighting manufacturers, but the LED lighting manufacturers as well, who were maybe skeptical that the market was ready to make the full switch to LEDs. So in turn, what happened is that they adjusted the efficiency levels um, required, the thresholds. So for controlled environment, horticulture spaces indoor that have more than 40 kW of aggregate horticultural lighting used for plant growth and maintenance. So specifically horticultural lighting, this is not your general lighting, okay? Um, must meet one of the following requirements. So they have to have a rate, they have to have a rated photosynthetic photon efficiency of at least 1.9 micromoles per joule. Okay, so micromoles per joule, that basically means how much of the electricity you use to power the light gets converted to usable photons by the plant. So the usable photons we consider PAR, right? The 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength of the spectrum. Um, uh, and, and, and that requirement of 1.9 micromoles is true for both integrated luminaires as well as removable or serviceable lamps. So like high pressure sodium lamps, right? You would replace the lamp, but keep the fixture. Um, that also has to have 1.9 micromoles per joule. Uh, you also need to have time uh, timers, basically. You need to be able to turn your lights on and off on a timer um, and have multi-level lighting controls. So just a quick interpretation, okay? So the con like I said, PPE, is the conversion of electrical energy to photons in the PAR region. And for those of you who are still concerned that this threshold is too high, um, I did want to point out that 85% of horticultural lighting right now is greater than 2.3 micromoles per, per joule. Um, and that comes from the Design Lighting Consortium. Um, so there's a lot of options out there for you that do even better than this minimum threshold. Um, so, so don't count it out yet, right? Um, 
Again, time switching controls is installing a timer on your lights and multi-level controls basically means if you have LEDs, choose the dimmable option. And if you're using high pressure sodium or ceramic metal halide, uh, checkerboard the operation of your lights. Be able to stage them on and off um, when, when they're needed or not needed, right? Because when your plants, when you first move your, your cannabis plants into the flowering room, maybe in those first few days, you don't need the full intensity of all those lights. So you can checkerboard them on. And, and and then later when when they get a little older, right, you would turn them all on uh, together. Uh, but at least now you have the option to sort of manage the lighting output, even based on your crop needs, right? Not even based on, on energy. Okay, so the third measure is again for indoors, and this is electrical power distribution. Basically, what they're saying is that they want you to be able to monitor electrical energy use. Okay, so, so you would set this up at your electrical panel usually, and they, they want to start with lighting. Lighting is the easiest thing to monitor and meter, um, and so we're starting there, um, but eventually, I, I hope anyway, eventually we will then start to um, look specifically uh, sub-meter HVAC systems and fans and, and other things. Don't be scared by that. These are good, these are good things, right? These are going to help all of us, including you, be able to uh, manage your costs of production even. Um, and, and the reason we want to do this, or the reason uh, the energy code is, is implementing this is to help with that benchmarking and help with developing that future performance path. Again, we're all a little bit in the dark, even after a 100-page lit review of how much energy and electricity CEH facilities are using. And so, so we want to start collecting that data um, so we can make better decisions and help you more. OK, so number four, there's a caveat to this one. This measure is for conditioned greenhouses. Not your traditional open air, evaporatively cooled, naturally ventilated greenhouse or, or tunnel. This is for a conditioned greenhouse that's using air conditioning. Okay, um, there's not a lot of you out there, but there are some of you who are who are air conditioning your greenhouse as if um, you were indoors to get more precise control. Well, for those of you who are doing that. Uh, there are now mandatory measures on the building envelope. So basically the greenhouse cover um, for opaque walls and opaque roof assemblies. <clears throat> you need to meet the requirements of section 120.7, um, which is you will find in the non-residential energy code uh, sections. Uh, also, Non-opaque envelopes need to have, so your transparent, okay, transparent envelope, your transparent glazing needs to have two or more glazing separated by either air or gas like argon. <clears throat> so basically, no single film glazing, no single polyethylene, no corrugated carbon, <laughs> no corrugated polycarbonate and no single pane glass. Um, the first two, I am 100% on board with. Um, I think, I probably shouldn't inject an opinion here, but I think corrugated polycarbonate is um, not very helpful to, to growers. So what are your options? Uh, double inflated polyethylene has a great R value, if you didn't know that. Uh, twin wall polycarbonate, also a great R value um, in transparency. And double or triple pane glass. Okay. The next measure is also for a conditioned greenhouse. And this is specifically for, uh, to, this is specific to HVAC. So the space conditioning systems need to comply with all the other energy code requirements around mechanical systems. So these conditioned greenhouses need to comply with non-residential building energy efficiency standards. And there are two primary ones. 
First is mandatory requirements um, for space conditioning equipment. That's basically equipment efficiency ratings, the EER, or the SEER, or the COP. You have to meet those uh, for a commercial building or, or for the greenhouses if you are a commercial building. Um, and then section 120.2, which is required controls for space conditioning. So there's requirements about the use of thermostats, not humidistats, not yet anyway, but thermostats and how they're used and their max and min settings. Um, again, you can check out those sections to learn more about them if you have a conditioned greenhouse. Okay, now all greenhouses, okay? So this is conditioned or, or you know, open air uh, type of greenhouse. It's basically the same requirements as indoor for horticultural lighting, except that the threshold is lower rather than 1.9 micromoles, it's 1.7 micromoles per joule PPE. Why is it lower? Well, one reason is because a lot of you said, well, hey, if I use high pressure sodium lamps, I can actually reduce my energy costs for heating in the winter. And when do I use my lights the most? In the winter um, as supplemental lighting, right? When I don't have the full effect of, of the sun, right? Um, so they listened and they said, okay, we're gonna reduce the threshold and allow less efficient light because that lower efficiency means more heat loss, right? More waste heat. Okay, and then time switching and multi-level controls are the same uh, for greenhouse and indoor. So looking ahead to 2025, Yes, of course, there are going to be new energy uh, efficiency standards or measures that are proposed. Um, the, the case team, the codes and standards enhancement initiative team, um, they will in the fall start to introduce potential future measures for consideration. Um, and, you know, they do a really good job at, at doing a deep dive to really understand the market and the impacts of energy savings and energy use and, and, and costs by the grower. So they'll do a full market analysis. Is this technology available, right? We don't want to propose something or they don't want to propose something that is not actually available on the market um, or that is so cost prohibitive because it's so new and innovative, right? That nobody's going to be able to afford it. Um, they're going to look at the potential energy use and cost savings. Again, they're going to look at the cost to implement those proposed measures. What is the labor and materials associated with implementing that measure? Um, they will propose the code language like what we just saw in those sections, and they have they will have stakeholder meetings. Right now, they're expected to ha happen in the fall sometime uh, this year, and then again in the spring in 2023 uh, with their final case report and recommendations in about a year, a year and a half from now. Um, also, uh, you know, there are opportunities as well to collect data from growers um, through surveys and benchmarking. So there is an online grower survey right now that we help develop um, that is available until September 9th, 2022. So if you are listening to this before that date, we would love to hear from you and to fill out that survey. We also, um, as part of the research we're doing for California as part of that, that um, lit review, one of the other pieces of that is doing facility site visits and talking directly to growers to learn what you're doing, uh, what you think of certain measures. Um, are you implementing energy efficiency strategies that nobody has already thought of that's working really well that maybe you know, we should consider? Not even just for regulations, right? Not just for the code, but also potentially to inform utilities to provide incentives and rebates until that technology becomes more mainstream and adopted and then right proves itself that okay this is something that everybody's using anyway right like this is easy to um to codify and then um 
the Resource Innovation Institute has their power score, um, which is a benchmarking tool. Um, I know that there are some jurisdictions that are now requiring it for reporting to get your license or to renew your license. Um, but for the most part, it's voluntary. And you tell RII, that benchmarking tool, um, you know, what systems you're using, how much energy and water and resources you're using. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty in depth. It's gonna take some time, um, but it's really, um, will really provide a lot of useful data um, for all of us going forward. So in summary, uh, controlled environment horticulture is regulated as a covered process, not a building type. There are basic mandatory measures related to HVAC, horticultural lighting, conditioned greenhouse envelope, and power metering. We need more data. We need a baseline understanding of facilities, systems, crops, and energy use. Um, we wanna know about energy efficiency strategies that are being implemented by growers. Um, we wanna rely less on modeling um, unvalidated models and more on data collection from actual operations. And we need to establish an industry accepted metric or, or a few metrics rather than 12 or 15. Like we need to come up with two or three, maybe that are even cross crop, right? That, that, that work for both lettuce and cannabis, not just one or the other. So, I wanna encourage you all to get involved, help us benchmark better. Take our online grower survey. Like I said, it closes September 9th. Here's the link. Participate in our facility site survey. This is only in California. We only have till the end of September of this year to go and visit your site and talk to you about what you're doing. Um, and you know there might be more opportunities in future years, but the opportunity is now, right? No time like the present. And generate your own power score, right? Go to the Resource Innovation Institute Cannabis Power Score. Uh, dot org website and take the time and fill it out and get to know your facility better and how it compares even to other facilities that are like yours. Share your experiences. So the Design Lights Consortium, they just published a new horticulture tech requirements version 3.0 um, and they are asking for public comments um, they are due by september 7th so you have a lot of homework in the next month uh, if you're listening to this in early august when i'm recording it um, and here's the link uh, to find that that draft um, that draft document for comment um, also again like i said the the 2025 uh, title 24 upcoming case studies uh, and proposed measures. Um, please join the stakeholder meetings. Um, and when public comment comes out in 2023, um, write letters. Uh, I wrote a couple of letters myself, uh, one of which was on the greenhouse envelope. I was really concerned that the U factor that was being um, proposed for all greenhouses was was basically going to eliminate everything except double and triple pane glass. Um, and so, you know, th that was not going to be very conducive to a commercially viable industry. And as you can see, they backed off and they even backed off of, um, you know, traditional greenhouses and focused it on conditioned. Um, so they listen. They really do. Um, and, and I encourage you to even do your own studies, right? Internal studies, because if you have the data for your facility um, that you can then share in these letters and public comments, um, they are more likely to listen to you because it's based on actual knowledge, right? It's based on actual data. The other thing that I want to encourage you to do is engage with your local county farm Bureau, um, you know, the the traditional horticulture and ornamental and nursery industries are pretty involved with the Farm Bureau and, and we've had some discussions with the California Farm Bureau about the energy code that's about to be implemented and future energy codes and, and they, you know, they are 
the voice for their stakeholders, which are farmers. And I know that cannabis has, you know, has traditionally traditionally thought of as other. But again, the more you introduce yourselves into the community, demonstrate that what you're doing is helping your community, creating jobs, right? Um, uh, improving the environment, not just destroying the environment, which is what everyone seems to think. Um, let them get to know you um, and, and let them help speak up for you uh, because they are there for you, for all farmers in California. And, you know, farming is what, the first or second largest industry in California. So um, they have a big voice um, and you can be a part of that. Okay, so um, some resources to learn more and, and to follow up on some of the things I talked about today. Um, here are some links for the Lit Review, for the California Energy Alliance, for the Design Lights Consortium, check them out. Also, uh, we have the Dr. Greenhouse Academy um, and we are going to make available um, on the Academy, the mandatory measures document. So not just the cut pieces um, that I showed on each of the slides, but the, the full document, uh, the lit review. And, and we have a lot more resources already on there that you might find interesting um, and informative uh, to what you're doing. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the Cannabis Business Times. Thank you so much for hosting and sponsoring this webinar. Um, also, thank you to the Local and State Emerging Technologies Program here in California. And, and also just thank you to the folks in the industry um, who vol have volunteered their time to take the survey, to talk to us, to um, to open their doors to our site surveys and just given general insights or specific insights into what has and hasn't worked for them or for the industry at large. So if you wanna learn more, please feel free to contact us. We wanna hear from you. If something that I talked about today, if you have a question, um, please contact us. We'd love to, to respond to you um, and, and try to answer your question. If some, you know, if a new idea popped to your head, uh, we wanna hear from you. And, and maybe even, you know, if you think that there's an energy efficiency measure that, oh, this is done every day, all the time. like let us know. If you read the lit review and you're like, I don't, I don't agree with that, or oh my God, I didn't realize that, please contact us. Um, if you want to invite us to your site for, for a facility visit, we want to hear from you. Um, you can find us on social media, of course, Instagram and LinkedIn. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks so much.